We all have a voice and we all have a role to play. And if you don't stand up and demand action, no one will. I'm Callie Buseman, and today I'm sitting with Senator Gillibrand for Broadly Meets. New York Congresswoman Kirsten Gillibrand is a force on the Senate floor, a wife and mother of two, and a fearless advocate for women's rights. Our colleagues are threatening yet another government shutdown, controlling women's choices. Gillibrand hails from Albany, New York. She became a lawyer at a corporate practice. Longing to have a position where she could actualize real change for those whose voices go unheard, she traded in her legal career for a life committed to public service. She has been changing the status quo ever since. In 2006, she ran on the Democratic ticket, winning a seat in the House of Representatives. Three years later, she was sworn in as a U.S. Senator, replacing Hillary Rodham Clinton, her mentor. Heralded by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world, and as founder of Off the Sidelines, a political action committee to push women to the forefront of the political scene, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand has become one of the most formidable players in shaping America's future. She is a prominent voice for ending campus rape, a champion for paid family maternity leave, and an advocate for human trafficking victims. Ask not what America can do for women, but ask what women can do for America. We are outside of Queensboro Hall. Senator Gillibrand is going to be arriving here soon to attend a roundtable on human trafficking. I'm Senator Gillibrand, and thank you all for coming. I'm really here to listen to each of you as our best advocates, as our greatest voices on this issue. I'm currently 19 years old, and at the age of 12, I was trafficked right here in Queens. The abuse, the physical pain, the emotional pain, the stigma, you know, I didn't even know there was a term for this. Uh, we have uh, several efforts underway on the federal level. We passed a trafficking bill in the Senate this year, which was a very good start. We're really at the tip of the iceberg. We have so much work left to be done, but we could not do any of it without all of you. We're in Midtown Manhattan outside the offices of Senator Gillibrand. We're going to go inside and talk to her about her experiences as a female politician, as well as some of the legislation she's been working on. It was so amazing to go with you to the Human Trafficking Roundtable. That sort of thing is, must be so important. The high prevalence of human trafficking we have in this city alone, in New York City, it is heartbreaking. For anyone who purchases sex, what disregard must they have for women? Why aren't we cracking down on the pimps and the Johns? Why aren't we creating felonies for these crimes? It is something I simply don't understand. We've passed a trafficking bill recently that's good, but not everything we need to do. We need to do far more for homeless youth. I talked to the not-for-profit providers that provide housing. They're all full. And you know who knows that? The traffickers and the pimps. We have to do more. Earlier this year, Senator Gillibrand co-sponsored an anti-trafficking bill with wide bipartisan support. Legislation was stalled after Democrats discovered that Republicans had slipped an anti-abortion provision into it, blocking trafficking victims from receiving federal funding for abortions. The law eventually passed with a compromise in place. But even with the trafficking bill, which was so important and so necessary, like, Republicans held that up. So, like, how do you how do you respond to that sort of thing? I knew we would pass the trafficking bill. And I knew if we played hardball, we would win. And that's what we ultimately did. You just have to know when you're right. And we were 100% right on that issue. So we had to wait. And it's a shame that this Congress spends more time worried about when you and I are having babies than national issues of importance. They have to spend all their time focused on women's reproductive health. It's makes no sense. I promise you, if we had 51% of women in Congress, we would not be debating access to birth control. It would not be on the national agenda. Do you feel like you're witnessing a cultural change right now with how women are treated in politics? I don't think there's a change so much in how they're treated, but I do see a change in women's role in politics, and specifically the role of younger women. Um, what I've seen in this debate about sexual assault on college campuses and in the military is these movements are being led by young women, women in their 20s. Specifically on the campus sexual assault, two young women, they just came to my office. It was Andrea and Annie, and they told me their stories of being raped, 
on college campuses, not only were they disbelieved, but they were retaliated against for reporting. They didn't take a back seat, they actually stood up and they spoke truth to power and they demanded action by their universities and they're changing, changing U.S. politics today. I think we'll pass this campus sexual assault bill this year because of their courage and hard work. Here you have people saying, you know, I was sexually assaulted, no one helped me, no one cared. And then there are people who are like, so what? <laughs> like, I just don't understand that. I think it goes to a very core issue about do you value women? And unfortunately, the answer for too many people is no. And they're not willing to make equality possible. And so I think what we have to do is continue to elevate women's voices. I think it's so important that women are asked to vote, that they're asked to be advocates, that they're asked to be heard on the things they care about. I know the idea of female mentorship is really, really important to you. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with Hillary Clinton? Mm -hmm. So Hillary is one of my greatest mentors and role models. Uh, she's someone I always looked up to when I was a young lawyer. And I just remember when she went to China as our first lady and she stood on that stage and she gave this really powerful speech taking on the status quo and saying women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. I, I remember feeling, what am I doing with my life? If I'm at any women's conference, I should be at that one. I realized at that moment I wasn't at the conference. I wasn't even invited to the conference because I wasn't involved in politics. And it was that wake up call for me that we all have a voice and we all have a role to play. So that's what got me started in politics as an adult. And then when I decided I wanted to run for office, she was the first person I went to for advice. And not only did she give me good advice, but she supported me in countless ways and made a huge difference in my ability to run for office successfully. That's such a huge life shift to go from being a lawyer to running for office. And I think it's, it seems so intimidating, especially as a woman. Did you have any anxieties about it? So I had much, much fewer anxieties than my family did. <laughs> when I started to talk to my family and friends about it, the only person who thought I had any chance of winning was my mother. And everybody else thought, you have no chance. And I was able to, over time, really create the confidence that I really wanted to run. I wanted to run for Congress. I wanted to be involved in the federal issues, the federal debates. But I wasn't afraid, and I wasn't afraid because I had a great role model in my grandmother, and she wasn't afraid to be involved in politics in an era when very few women were involved in politics. And she wasn't afraid to be heard. She organized other women and got them all to work on campaigns and really create a place for them, themselves in upstate New York. Politics can be rough, and I think it mm -hmm. can be especially rough if you're a woman. Yes. What sort of sexism did you experience in your time in office? Well, in my first campaign, one of the first insults my opponent shot across the bow was, she's just a pretty face. And I thought, wow, that's really mean. <laughs> so one tactic they often use in campaigns is they criticize all the, the men around a woman. They criticize my husband, my father, my father-in-law. Like, just to say she's not even worthy of criticism. It's just a way to undermine women. A lot of studies have shown when someone does criticize you for your appearance, it does undermine you. It seems like there's no proper amount of attractiveness to be as a female politician. <laughs> Either you're pretty so no one can trust you, or you're not pretty enough so no one can trust you. It's like, yeah. which... But it's a, it's a typical tool. It's just a tool to undermine her. It's an issue that affects women in all workplaces. Uh, I remember when I was a young lawyer at a big dinner, my boss gets up and says, and let's thank Kirsten for all her hard work, and don't you just love her new haircut? I was mortified. I've been working late nights for over a year. You can't possibly be commenting on my looks. It's the landscape we all work on in all industries, and I just want young women to know it doesn't define you. Someday you can set the tone at that company. Someday be that guy's boss. You can overcome it. I remember when your memoir came out, you had written about um, some sexist comments that your colleagues had made to you about they basically sexually harassed you and made comments about your weight. And then there was this whole thing where people were mad at you for not naming them. Yeah, they, who they were is irrelevant. Yeah. I was a member of Congress, for goodness sakes. If somebody calling me chubby, somebody, you know, saying you're even pretty when you're fat, I'd already reached a level of seniority in my career and could have that self-confidence. I'm much more worried about the young woman in the beginning of her career who somehow is dismissed or judged on her looks. That's harder to take. What do you think of women who are in favor of limiting other women's access? I think they're wrong, and I think they're a very small minority. One of the reasons why I work so hard to engage women 
is because I think their life experiences are different. I think what you and I live is going to be very different from our male peers. And one misconception a lot of women might have is that I'm sure someone's doing that. I'm sure someone's advocating for that issue. The truth may be no one is advocating for that issue. And if you don't stand up and demand action, no one will. I feel that women's voices are essential for our democracy. And so I really work hard to elect more women candidates, to cultivate women, to run, to help them be successful, and to help more women vote and be heard on the things they care about.